Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the GraphTech Second Quarter 2022 Earnings Conference Call and Webcast. At this time, all lines are in listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If at any time during this call you require immediate assistance, please press star zero for the operator. This call is being recorded today, Friday, August the 5th, 2022. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mike Dillon. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Graphic International's second quarter 2022 earnings call. On with me today are Marcel Kessler, Chief Executive Officer, Jeremy Halford, Chief Operating Officer, and Tim Flanagan, Chief Financial Officer. Marcel will begin with a few opening comments after which Jeremy will discuss safety, sales, and operational matters. Tim will review our quarterly results and other financial details. Marcel will close with comments on our outlook. We will then open the call to questions. Turning to our next slide, as a reminder, some of the matters discussed on this call may include forward-looking statements regarding, among other things, performance trends and strategies. These statements are based on current expectations and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated by forward-looking statements are shown here. We will also discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures, and these slides include the relevant non-GAAP reconciliations. You can find these slides in the Investor Relations section of our website at www.graphtech.com. A replay of the call will also be available on our website. I'll now turn the call over to Marcel. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our second quarter earnings call. Starting on a personal note, I am excited to have joined GraphTech at this important time, and I am honored to have the opportunity to lead the company through its next phase of evolution. I was attracted to GraphTech because I see a set of distinctive assets and capabilities that give me confidence in our ability to deliver shareholder value over the long term. I believe that we are well positioned to participate in the growth of the graphite electrode market and have a promising foundation to potentially pursue other avenues of growth in the future. During my first few weeks at GraphTech, I've had the opportunity to get to know many of our associates, and I'm very impressed by their level of know-how, energy, and dedication. Turning to the second quarter, we are pleased to have delivered results in the period despite the challenges brought on by geopolitical conflict and economic uncertainty. Our ability to sustain key operating and financial metrics comparable to prior year levels is a testament to our operational execution and competitive advantages. I would like to thank the entire GraphTech team for their hard work. I will now turn the call over to Jeremy for an update on safety, sales, and operational performance. Thank you, Marcel, and good morning, everyone. I'll start my comments with a brief update on health and safety excellence, which is a core value at GraphTech as people are our most important asset. We remain encouraged that our overall performance in this area continues to place us in the top quartile of operators in the broader manufacturing industry. However, our year-to-date reportable incident rate through the end of the second quarter compares unfavorably to the past two years, and we are not satisfied with this result. Going forward, we will continue to emphasize that safety must be fundamental to everything we do and that key safety initiatives must be prioritized. We will remain steadfast in working toward our ultimate goal of sending every employee home safely every day. Turning to slide five, let me provide a few data points on second quarter steel industry performance as context for our results. Global steel production, excluding China, declined 6% in the second quarter compared to the same period in 2021. Commensurate with that lower production, global capacity utilization rates also declined, but remain in line with the industry average for the past several years. We are increasingly seeing diverging steel industry trends in different geographic regions. This includes softness in steel markets such as Western Europe, reflecting, among other things, the economic and supply chain impact of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Conversely, the U.S. steel market has shown more resilience, 
as evidenced by utilization rates that remain elevated compared to the global industry. Turning to our second quarter performance, starting on slide six. Our second quarter production volume increased 1% year over year to 44,000 metric tons as our plants continue to operate at high levels of capacity utilization. We sold 42,000 metric tons of graphite electrodes in the quarter, representing a slight decline both year over year and sequentially, reflecting the volume impact of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Our second quarter electrode shipments were comprised of 24,000 metric tons sold under our LTAs at a weighted average realized price of $9,600 per metric ton, and 18,000 metric tons of non-LTA sales at a weighted average realized price of $6,000 per metric ton. This non-LTA pricing represented a 46% increase over the second quarter of 2021 and was in line with the first quarter of 2022, consistent with the expectations we provided on our first quarter earnings call. As we proceed through the remainder of the year, we expect our weighted average non-LTA pricing for the second half to be comparable to the pricing realized in the first half of 2022. Net sales in the second quarter were 364 million, representing an increase of 10% compared to the second quarter of 2021. This, re this reflected the higher non-LTA pricing, partially offset by a mix, in, a mix shift from LTA to non-LTA business, as well as the decline in overall sales volume. FX also had a slightly unfavorable impact on our year-over-year -year and sequential net sales performance during the second quarter. This primarily reflects the strengthening U.S. dollar versus the euro and Japanese yen, as a portion of our sales are denominated in these and other foreign currencies. However, the FX top-line headwind is more than offset on the bottom line by a benefit to COGS related to Euro-denominated spending in our European operations. Let me now turn it over to Tim to cover the rest of our financial details. Thanks, Jeremy, and good morning to everybody on the call. Net income totaled $115 million in the second quarter, or 44 cents of, uh, 44 cents of earnings per share on both the gap and adjusted basis. Second quarter adjusted EBITDA was $158 million, a decrease of 1% compared to the second quarter of 2021, as higher year-over-year -year costs offset the increase in net sales. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 44% in the second quarter. Let me take a minute to exp expand briefly on our costs. Like nearly all other industries, we continue to be impacted by global inflationary pressures, which is particularly acute in Europe, driven by higher energy prices. Specific to our business, the impacts are most significant for certain key raw materials, energy, and freight. For the second quarter, we experienced a year-over-year increase of approximately 21% in recognized COGS per metric ton, excluding depreciation and amortization. This represented a 7% sequential increase compared to the first quarter of 2022. We expect sequential cost inflation to persist at a similar rate in the third quarter. That being said, we continue to focus prudently on managing our operating and discretionary spending as we navigate the current inflationary environment. Turning to cash flow. In the second quarter, we generated $60 million of cash from operations and $48 million of adjusted free cash flow. Both measures decreased compared to the second quarter of 2021, reflecting higher working capital. This higher working capital was driven by an increase in inventory reflecting both the cost impact I just spoke to, as well as higher quantities as production volume outpaced sales in the first half of 2022. Inventory builds occurred during the second quarter in advance of planned third quarter outages at our European electrode facilities and our Seadrift New to Coke production facility, also in anticipation of upcoming outages at certain oil refineries that supplies decan oil. Additionally, early in the second quarter, in response to market disruptions related to the conflict in Ukraine, on-hand quantities for certain raw materials that are essential to our manufacturing process were increased above our typical safety stock levels. These actions were taken proactively to enable us to meet the electrode supply needs of our customers, despite the current uncertainties in the global supply chain. As we move beyond the outage windows in the third quarter, 
and our, as our visibility into supply chain continues to increase, we anticipate beginning to unwind the inventory build as we proceed through the back half of 2022. Turning to slide eight. We further strengthen our balance sheet with a $40 million reduction in our term loan during the second quarter, resulting in a total debt pay down of $110 million on a year-to-date basis. Our debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio is 1.4 times as of June 30th, compared to 1.6 times at the end of 2021. During the second quarter, we executed an amendment to our revolving credit facility, which increased our borrowing capacity by $80 million for a new total capacity of $330 million. We ended the quarter with total liquidity of approximately $382 million, consisting of $56 million of cash and $326 million available under the revolver. Now on to slide nine. Maintaining a prudent and disciplined capital allocation strategy remains a priority. This includes a continued focus on reducing debt to further strengthen our balance sheet and support our strategic flexibility, while also returning capital to our stockholders and investing in our business. During the second quarter, we repurchased $30 million of our common stock, resulting in a total of $60 million repurchased for, through the first half of 2022. We ended the quarter with $99 million remaining available under our stock repurchase program. In addition, we continue to expect our 2022 capital expenditures to be in the range of $70 to $80 million. As the industry moves toward more EAF-based deal production, we will continue to invest in our high-quality, low-cost global operating assets to meet the growing demand that this ship will create over the long term. We will remain prudent in managing our CapEx spend prioritizing those projects with the highest return on investment. Now let me turn it back to Marcel for his perspective on the outlook. Thank you, Tim. As is the case for most manufacturing-based sectors at this point in time, the operating environment for the steel industry remains volatile. Global steel prices have retreated from recent highs, and global steel production, excluding China, declined 6% both in the second quarter and year-to-date compared to the same period in 2021. As Jeremy indicated, we continue to see diverging steel industry trends in different geographical regions, with softening in certain markets, such as Western Europe, while other markets, such as the United States, have been more resilient. For brass tech, the near-term outlook is becoming more challenging, with higher raw material, energy, and logistics costs, as well as the impact of the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. At the same time, the shift in mix from LTA to non-LTA business continues. To get ahead of these near-term challenges, we continue to strengthen our commercial capabilities, prudently manage operating and capital expenditures, and we will continue to focus on reducing our long-term debt. We will also continue to invest in our product and service capabilities to be optimally positioned to participate in the longer-term demand growth for graphite electrodes. We remain confident that the steel industry's accelerating efforts to decarbonize will lead to further growth in the electric arc furnace method of steelmaking, driving demand for graphite electrodes. To that point, Announcements of planned EAF capacity additions by steel producers across the industry could result in annual incremental graphite electrode demand of over 200 tons globally, excluding China, by 2030. As a leader in the graphite electrode industry, this supports our positive long-term outlook for our business. We also anticipate the demand for petroleum needle coke a key raw material used to accelerate batteries for the growing electric petroleum needle coke as another positive long-term trend for our business, as higher demand will result in continued pricing for needle coke. Our vertical integration into petroleum needle coke production via our seizure facility is foundational for our ability to reliably deliver high-quality graphite electrodes. With these sustainable competitive advantages and a strong and committed team, we are confident in our ability to deliver shareholder value over the long term. 
That concludes our prepared remarks. We will now open the call for questions. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star followed by the number two. One moment, please, for your first question. Your first question comes from David Galliano of BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. Um, I just wanted to ask a few operational type of questions first, just clarification on the near term. Um, first of all, on, on the pricing, I believe the commentary was comparable pricing in the spot market, second half versus first half. Uh, I, I think historically, or recent historically, um, you know, the commentary was there's about a six to nine month you know, lead time, you know, obviously it's spot, but there's lead times associated with it. And the commentary was expectations for prices to continue to improve in the second half. So I believe. So now the comment being flat, is that because more recent contracts being or, or, or volumes being signed or being signed at lower prices? Can you just give a little more color on, you know, the pricing dynamic that you're seeing right now in the spot market? Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. I appreciate your question. Um, Really, a lot of this comes down to some uh, some macro factors, you know, just given that the world economy has been pretty dynamic and there's a variety of market forces at work in different regions, and, you know, most notably what's going on in the Ukraine-Russia uh, situation and the impact that's having on energy prices, uh, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing things that are diverging regionally, and it's important to recognize that the anticipated pricing that we're talking about here is a global average. Um, as we discussed in the uh, in the remarks, we're seeing some continued resilience in certain regions and softness in others. And essentially what's happening is that this softness is manifesting itself in a variety of different ways, including announcements by steelmakers, particularly those in Europe, that they're uh, avoiding operations during certain peak power times or they're extending their planned uh, summer outages due to high power costs. And so these reduced operating rates are having the impact of uh, increasing electrode inventory at certain customers, particularly in Europe, and consequently reducing demand in the short term, ultimately applying some downward pressure on pricing in certain regions that you know is beyond what we had anticipated earlier. So this has really limited some of the price escalation that we were previously anticipating. It's also worth noting that uh, FX is playing a role here, as, we, uh, as you know, we report in USD, and we've seen a pretty dramatic uh, run-up in the value relative to the euro and the Japanese yen. And so given that some of our sales are contracted in euro and yen, price increases that we anticipated on those sales in local currency don't necessarily report in, uh, don't translate into reported price increases on a USD basis. But having said that, you know, I think it's important to note that, uh, that this is a short-term impact. Over the medium term and long term, we remain very bullish on our core markets, and we believe that the value proposition of the EAF uh, process to help decarbonize the steelmaking industry is, uh, is undeniable, and that's being borne out in the various new EAF projects that have been announced globally for the coming years. As, uh, as Marcel noted, uh, we're monitoring over 150 new EAF projects uh, in uh, this time period through 2030 that will generate 200,000 tons of incremental electro demand during that time frame. And these new, these new furnaces are going to require the latest and greatest in electro technology, and we believe that our value proposition to support these uh, high-efficiency EAFs through our product technology, our um, and you know our ability to promise uh, stability of uh, of supply through our vertical integration through sea drift is really going to be shifting a lot of these market dynamics in our favor. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you for that answer. And and just to follow up on the uh, commentary, obviously sounds you know cautious in the near term. Historically, um, you know, Graphic has been a a leader at points in, in terms of meaningfully reducing volumes in a, in a, in a week uh, a weaker demand environment um, considering the situation now 
Can you speak more specifically to second half or third quarter and second half volume expectations? Um, you know, how low will Graph Tech take its uh, volumes in the second half of this year? Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, yeah, as we talk about the second half of the year, certainly, um, you know, I, I think you know, if we look at our contracted sales, um, you know, uh, we provided the guidance for the full year on the LTA volume, and obviously we have to deliver uh, against those volumes. And, um, you know, the order book is otherwise pretty full uh, in the back half of the year uh, on the non-LTA side as well. You know, I, I guess the, the question always becomes, and, and we've talked or alluded to in some of our commentary about the efforts to, uh, to replace the impacted tons because of the conflict uh, in the Ukraine. Um, you know, those, those have to come out, you know, in a profitable manner. So, as we look at, at the, the end of the year, you know, certainly uh, the escalating costs uh, in Europe, um, you know, we're looking at those on an order-by-order -order basis to make sure that, uh, that they're, they're profitable. But as long as we can continue to sell tons as profitable, we'll, we'll ship as many tons as we can in the back half of the year. Um, and we'll, we'll, you know, from an operational standpoint, we'll continue to match our production uh, to that sales demand, right, and, and make sure that we have sufficient uh, graphite electrode uh, inventories on hand at the end of the year as we head into the first quarter of next year as well. Okay, so when you put all that together, you know, what's 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 reasonable? If I look back the last, you know, um, uh, whatever, back to 2018, 3Q specifically, volumes, um, you know, were below. Obviously, there's some challenging times there, but volumes went down to 32,000 tons in, in 2020, uh, 39,000 last year. Is it you know reasonable to be within those two zones for 3Q, 32 to 39, somewhere in that band? No, I would think we would expect certainly as we look to the back half of the year to be more in line with where we've been, not going down okay. to the level that you quoted in 2018 or, or what we saw uh, even last year. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And then just one last one for me. Um, just on the longer term, we're getting closer, obviously, uh, four months, five months away from uh, the end of the, you know, from the from the from the meaningful wind down, and and you know, market doesn't sound great. What's um, you know the updated thoughts on extending the LTAs, um, and 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 is there is there actually any negotiations happening along those lines for 23, 24, and beyond? Thank you for that question, David. It's Marcel here, so. And maybe it's, first of all, it's important to point out that, that GrassTech has been providing gra graphite electrodes for a very long time before entering into any LTAs. So I think we're fully prepared to, to handle uh, the, this change. Now, we continue to believe that there is a role that multi-year agreements will play in our portfolio, and they can be a win-win for our customers and for us, providing our customers with a hedging mechanism and surety of supply by locking in a portion of our cash flow. So I think as we move forward here, we will look to offer our customers a variety of contract terms tailored to their needs. Uh, specifically to your question, so we have had discussions with some customers already and would expect to have some new multi-year agreements in place by the end of this year and into next year. Now, in general, we would expect those new agreements to be based on the current market conditions at the time that they are entered into, that they're entered into, although we may consider a variety of pricing structures that suit the needs of both uh, us and our customers. Uh, however, it is important to note that while we will continue to offer multi-year agreements as an important part of our commercialization strategy and value proposition, we do not anticipate that they will make up the majority of our portfolio moving forward. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dave. Your next question comes from Kurt Woodworth of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Kurt. Um, you know, so with respect to the third quarter, it seems like volumetrically you're, you're guiding roughly flattish um, and pricing basically the same on non-LTA. Um, so from a cost perspective, can, can you talk through how you see cost progression in the quarter? You talked about you're going to have an outage in Europe, an outage at Cedarus, so I assume then you're going to have to buy in more third-party Coke. 
um, and then you have inflationary pressures on top of that, and then I, I would tend to assume that the merchant Coke price would be going up sequentially as well. Um, so can you walk through some of those moving pieces just to help us get a little bit better um, gauge on the court, third quarter? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Kurt, for that. And I think there's about six questions or points in there, um, but uh, I'll try to make sure I, I hit them all. Um, you know, so as it relates to the outages, you know, certainly these are our planned activities. Um, you know, we, we take down our European operations annually, um, and this coincides with a lot of holiday periods uh, for our, our folks over in Europe, and we do a lot of uh, maintenance and repair work during that time. Um, and then also Sea Drift, uh, we do a biannual turnaround uh, and, and major maintenance activities uh, down at Sea Drift. So uh, in our prepared remarks, I commented on the inventory build that we had uh, and that was uh, done twofold. One, to make sure we had the graphite electrode inventory to, uh, to ship to our customers throughout the third quarter and not have any disruption in supply, certainly. But then also, you know, making sure that we have sufficient needle coke uh, on hand uh, as we uh, continue to uh, to produce uh, in the back half of the third quarter, if you will. So uh, a lot of that is already uh, in our results and in, in, in our uh, our cash flows, if you will. You know, and then we'll continue to work that down through the back half of the year. On the cost side, um, yeah, certainly, um, you know. Inflationary forces are, are, have impacted us and will continue to impact us. You know, I think we're looking at, uh, you know, sequential uh, cost increase of, of roughly 7% in line with, with where we were uh, Q1 to Q2. And that's really driven, you know, on a, on a couple key areas. First of all, European power pricing, right? Um, you know, uh, overall energy is a relatively small piece of our overall portfolio of costs, and, and we're we're largely fixed in Europe um, for energy. We're at probably 80% uh, fixed on the power side, 65% uh, fixed on the gas side. Um, but if you look at the volatility of the uh, the gas market in Europe right now, the Dutch TTF has swung from um, 110 euros a megawatt hour to where it's sitting today at $200 a megawatt hour uh, you know, over the last four months. So even with, with having as much that we have hedged, um, those wild swings are gonna have an impact on our results. Um, we mentioned raw materials, and, and certainly, you know, if we think about pitch, uh, which is again a, a key uh, key element in the manufacturing of an electrode, um, you know, the conflict in Ukraine disrupted the uh, the European pitch market in the latter part of Q1 and into Q2. Um, and while we've stabilized that supply chain and, and we've locked in the supply that we need, that pitch pricing and the associated logistics with it, you know, have certainly gone up. Ecan oil. You know, that trades off of, of Brent and uh, a spread over Brent, and, and those markets have uh, continued to, uh, to increase. Um, so despite our hedges, um, you know, we're still seeing some, uh, some cost inflation on the decant side. Um, you know, I guess you know, commenting that you can't hedge 100% of, uh, of your need, and, and we can't hedge that, uh, that spread over uh, Brent to uh, what decant's traded at. Now, the last point on cost, logistics, right? Um, you know, I think... Logistics pricing remains elevated or continues to elevate for certain routes, and in particular that affects us is North America to Europe and vice versa, um, and reliability of logistics remains at an all-time low. So um, those are maybe a little bit of color on, on some of the cost headwinds that, that we're facing, but you know we continue to work to, to mitigate that the best we can. Um, and I think your last comment or question was around third-party needle coke, um, you know, and I think on the needle coke side, um, you know, if we look at the import statistics that we often reference on these calls, uh, again, I'll just remind that they, they are uh, a month or so dated, uh, and they are just a reference point, but, you know, you're, you're trading at a range of $26 to $2,900 a ton, which is up, you know, call it $300 a ton on the high end. So uh, we continue to see uh, increases in needle coat through the first half of the year, as anticipated and expected. Uh, we may be seeing a little bit of plateauing here in the near term. Um, but uh, but that's kind of what we're seeing uh, from a needle coat perspective at this point in time. Great, super helpful. And then, um, you know, your comments on on petroleum, coke, and kind of the interplay in, in the lithium ion battery. I mean, there, there's a lot of debate, I think, around the ultimate mix of, you know, both the natural versus synthetic graphite component in the anode, and then even within the synthetic piece, you know, the combination between petroleum coke or um, coal tar pitch coke. 
So, you know, I just want to see, do you have a view on, you know, kind of the composition and the evolution of that market? Um, would you have any interest long term in terms of, you know, getting into the merchant um, EV market? You know, we, we obviously saw the deal that PSX announced with um, uh, Novonics. Yeah, so um, happy to uh, happy to comment on that. The um, as we think about the lithium ion battery space, it's clear that this is going to be a huge driver of needle coat consumption. As uh, as I think as I think you're aware, uh, regardless of the battery chemistry, when we talk about the cathode, whether it be a lithium ion phosphate or nickel manganese cobalt or whatever, in every case, the anode is graphite. And so, and so within that, um, as we see the EV uh, adoption continuing to increase, that's, that's going to drive an increase in the amount of lithium ion batteries that are sold. And the other thing that we're seeing is a continued growth in the uh, megawatt hours of the batteries that are going into uh, these EVs. And so when we put all of that together, really what it's telling us is that between now and 2030, we expect about a 23% compound annual growth rate in the amount of synthetic graphite and consequently needle coke that's being consumed in that market. So it will be a meaningful driver of the underlying economics in the needle coke world. Whether or not we uh, we ultimately choose to participate in, uh, in that space is something that we're exploring currently. Um, uh, and, you know, kind of more to come on that. Uh, but uh, to your point, uh, Kurt, the, um, uh, you know, this is clearly a driver uh, of, uh, of needle coke and needle coke's consumption. And, uh, you know, and we think that that is going to uh, continue to be supportive of our value proposition as we go forward. And, uh, and our competitors need to increasingly, uh, uh, increasingly rely on uh, uh, pardon me, rely exclusively on third-party sources of that needle coke, whereas uh, we will be able to offer our customers, our electrode customers, surety of supply given the uh, uh, given our vertical integration. Great. Thank you very much. That's all. Your next question comes from Aaron Biswanachan of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Great, thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah, just picking up that last line of questioning, and 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 I guess uh, you know, kind of uh, touching on something you said earlier as far as utilization rates. So, um, what is the the capacity that GraphTech has uh, to potentially dial back its own utilization rates? Where are you guys running? I guess um, across your different facilities, uh, across your system, and um, just curious if you've made some conscious decisions to reduce rates in Europe, um, and then also uh, you're just, just given the, the, the reduction in, in steel utilization rates that you referenced, and then, um, you know, if so, would you be able to redirect some of that, um, you know, needle coke volume potentially into the EV market and, and uh, potentially start that process? I, I, I'm sure you're early on in that, in that exploration, but just want to get your thoughts on that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, great question, and th uh, thanks, Arun. The um, uh, so starting with a, a discussion about uh, utilization rates in our factories in Europe, uh, um, where our factories in general, as um, a as we've said uh, historically, we've got about a about 200,000 tons of capacity that you know we could reasonably expect to have operating at you know at 90% of capacity. And so that would say, uh, you know, roughly 45,000 tons in a quarter. And there's a little bit of seasonality to that, but, uh, you know, uh, given that we're going to take things down for a couple of weeks in, uh, in the third quarter. So that would tell you that we, you know, we, we're continuing to run our factories uh, pretty hard right now uh, uh, in order to ensure that we protect our customers. As we go forward, we're continuously monitoring the, um, you, you know the underlying economics of running those factories, and um, you know comparing the, uh, comparing the, those economics to our ability to command price on the selling side, and 
you know, we'll make uh, we'll make prudent decisions as uh, as this progresses, and we're uh, we're selling incremental tons. And so, you know, fortunately, uh, if we go back in time a little bit, we've really dialed up a lot of our focus on ESG initiatives, and in particular, the environmental side of things. And so, we do have some things that we were doing to improve the energy efficiency of our facilities uh, around the globe, but I'm talking specifically about Europe right now. And some of those investments that we were making primarily for environmental purposes now uh, now command or now generate a pretty substantial uh, economic return given the price of gas and where it's going. And so as we think about how we, uh, how we run our factories and how we, uh, how we prioritize our business, we're, uh, we expect that as we look into the, uh, into the medium term, we will start seeing some benefit from investments that were initially made more for uh, environmental reasons will now be generating pretty strong financial results for us as well. Um, coming back around then to the, uh, uh, your question about uh, our ability to produce more needle coke in sea drift and our ability to potentially get into the lithium ion battery uh, world, we, uh, I think we've said before that kind of the headline capacity at Sea Drift is about 140,000 metric tons, and uh, given that our internal consumption is meaningfully higher than that, we do uh, we do buy third-party coke from a variety of places, and so that does give us uh, you know some strategic flexibility if we were to decide to get into that space to use some of our internal capacity to uh, to test that market while um, continuing to utilize third-party sources for some of our internal usage as we, um, as we carry that forward. So um, I hope I touched on all, uh, on all points of your question, but uh, you know, happy to go deeper somewhere if you'd like. Great. No, that was very helpful. Um, and then I guess I also wanted to obviously get your, your, your thoughts on, on uh, you know, the markets and electrodes and needle coke as well. So, um, you know, you noted that there's been some pullback, uh, you, you know, in seal utilization rates causing some inventory build on the electrode side and, um, you know, some some uh, impact on pricing. Um, how long do you think that will last? I mean, do you think we're kind of in the early stages of that, just given what's going on with demand and, um, you know, the macro side? Um, and I guess, has it impacted needle coke as well? Could you just comment on you know, where prices are in, in, in needle coke um, in the spot market. And, uh, you know, if you see uh, that also kind of in the early stages of that uh, uh, inventory build. Well, I, I will, it's Marcel here, or maybe one comment and I will pass uh, back to Jeremy for the statistics on the needle coke, I think. Um, just reinforcing our earlier comments, right? We are currently in an operating environment does, that does remain very volatile. And while we remain optimistic about the long-term fundamentals of our business, uh, this near-term uncertainty in the broader market is the reason why we will refrain from providing more specifics on our 2020 through outlook at this time. Um, but Jeremy, is there anything you want to add more specifically on the question for needle coke pricing? Yeah, so um, I think what uh, what we've seen, I think Tim referenced that we've seen about a three hundred dollar run up in uh, in third party needle coke uh, prices based on the uh, the import export statistics that we monitor. And so, uh, so despite the um, you know the you know the softening of the market in uh, in certain regions of the world, uh, you know we think that uh, you know needle coke pricing is uh, you know is Elevated compared to where it has historically been, but we think that as we look at the, uh, you know, the various factors that are going to affect it, we think that there's at least support for the current levels, and uh, um, you know, and likely, uh, you know, room to grow even from where uh, uh, from where they're at right now. And so, essentially, what um, you know, what you know, the way I would characterize it is that any. Uh, demand slowdown that we're seeing on the graphite electrode side is being more than made up for on the lithium ion battery side. And so, um, so you know, our, our anticipation is that we'll continue to see strength in the needle coke pricing. 
Great, thanks. And then um, I guess the, the last question I had was just on uh, in the needle cook market. Have you seen, um, you know, other electrode manufacturers uh, using pitch needle coke um, to make uh, ultra high performance electrodes? Um, I'm just curious if there's any observations you've had, you know, maybe potentially with capacity in China or elsewhere. Um, has there been any innovation to to, to, to uh, you know make UHPs from pitch needle coke, and uh, is that also causing extra supply in the market? Yeah, so uh, so uh, another uh, great question. I appreciate that. The uh, as we look at uh, our competitors and what they're doing, obviously we I mean, we're not uh, inside their factory, so we don't know for sure what they're uh, what they're doing with pitch uh, pitch based needle coke. What um, you know, we ourselves have looked at this uh, uh, in the past as, as uh, you know, thinking about pitch based needle coke, and um, have concluded that it was not suitable for us and our applications. Um, you know, primarily given some uh, you know some you know, chemistry issues within it, and what it would do to our processing times. It would drive a significant amount of inefficiency in our manufacturing process to be able to make a UHP electrode using our process. It could certainly be done, but we don't think that it could be done in, an, uh, in as efficient a manner as we're able to accomplish with petroleum-based needle coke. Perfect. Thanks a lot. We'll turn it over. Your next question comes from Alex Hacking of City Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, I have two or three follow-up questions, if that's okay. Um, so on the, uh, I guess, the, the cost side, the production side, um, are there meaningful cost differentials opening up between your production facilities in Europe and, and, um, and, and Monterey? And, you know, is there a point where it sort of makes sense to shift your operating footprint a little bit, you know, move volumes more towards North America? You know, even consider reopening St. Mary's, um, or the cost differentials is not not that great. Yeah, so thanks, Alex. I appreciate that question, and, and I'll take the first part, and then let Jeremy tackle the, the operating portfolio. And you know, certainly there there are cost differentials between all of our sites, right? You know, in, in terms of the regions we operate, um, you know, North American energy prices are substantially lower than what we see in Europe right now, uh, and even on a historic basis, you know, North American. Uh, Natural gas is much cheaper than European natural gas, and you have labor differences, differentials as well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you look at all those, that there's not a wide disparity in terms of our cost structure, um, you know, on average. But uh, but certainly, I would say right now, uh, the European power pricing does uh, pose a unique challenge to those operations. And Jeremy, I don't know if you want to talk about kind of the overall network. But yeah, yeah. So um, uh, so Alex. You know, uh, as you would probably have anticipated, given this uh, this difference that's opened up that Tim was talking about, and some of the uh, differences in uh, steel utilization rates in North America versus Europe, you, you know, we have you know substantially all of our lean and continuous improvement team. Um, we have all of those resources focused on debottlenecking everywhere we can in North America. You know, and Monterey obviously being a key driver of that. So. So uh, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, to the extent that we can uh, continue to open up incremental capacity um, in Monterey, that's, uh, that's what we have our resources focused on doing right now. As we, uh, uh, you know, in response to your question on St. Mary's, you know, as you know, we've, uh, we've increased the amount of activity in the St. Mary's facility with the installation of the new pin machining line that complements the graphitization activities that were already taking place there. And, uh, you know, I, I would point out that I'm, uh, I'm actually quite pleased with the St. Mary's team and their performance on commissioning and ramping up that equipment. And uh, they've demonstrated the ability to run that equipment at the, de at the designed rate. And so as we go forward, you know, St. Mary's, you know, it is a location with uh, plentiful access to reasonably priced energy, and you know that's a factor that we need to consider as we think about this. But um, you know, at, at the moment, it remains you know just a um, you know one more 
uh, one more uh, arrow in our strategic quiver, if I could put it that way. You know, uh, nothing to uh, nothing to announce in terms of uh, anything beyond that, but uh, but obviously something that we continue to keep in mind as we uh, as we explore what we're going to do with the manufacturing footprint. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I, I just wanted to follow up on your answer to Dave's question earlier on the LTA. So. Now, I, I think what you said was, you know, you are in discussion on LTAs with certain customers, it's going to be, you know, a lot lower volume going forward. Um, would these LTAs be, you know, similar uh, multi-year fixed price structure as, as, the, um, as the old ones were? And, I mean, I guess in terms of pricing, I'm not sure what you can say, probably not much, but I guess from my perspective, I'm not sure how attractive it would be to be um, fixing current spot prices, you know, for multiple years, you know, given the, you know, the, the volatility on, on the cost side. So, you know, I guess any, any more color on the LTA process, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And, and I'll add to, to the comments Marcel provided earlier. Um, you know, certainly, yeah, we do expect it to be a lower overall percentage of our portfolio, um, you know, Marcel commented on the fact that you know we've operated without LTAs in the past, right? And, and these are these are a good option for both us strategically as well as our customers, as they have certainty of supply. And, and I think over the last couple of years, we've seen enough supply disruptions that you know companies are looking for uh, a little bit more of that certainty. But you know we don't have a gun to our head necessarily where we feel compelled that we have to load you know 50% of our order book or, or 80% of our order book with you know fixed price long term agreements, right? We can be strategic about it, uh, enter into those partnerships with those uh, customers that uh, I think there's a mutual uh, value perceived out of those uh, those long-term relationships, uh, and that's the way we're approaching it, and, and that's certainly the approach uh, in the customers that we're having the discussions with currently, how they're viewing it as well. So um, we look at these as a, a mutual benefit to both, um, but again, don't feel uh, compelled to, to lock in at any price, certainly. Um, I think as we look going forward, you know, I think there's a, a variety of pricing structures that could be introduced uh, under these agreements, whereby um, they may not uh, they may not look and feel like the original kind of Gen One, if you want to call them that, LTAs that were were signed, you know, five years ago or so. Okay, thanks. Makes sense. Um, and then just one final question, which was something that an an investor asked me, and it's kind of an interesting question. Wasn't quite sure of the answer. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you're, you're not making um, needle coke from from pitch, but for those that are, you know, is is the coal price um, provide rel you know some kind of relative cost support for for um, for for that needle coke for the pitch needle coke, or it's not really relevant because it's a, because it's a byproduct. Thanks. Yeah, so, uh, so Alex, I would be speculating if I tried to answer that, so it's probably better if I don't. Um, it, yeah, I, I apologize, but I, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't want to mislead uh, you or somebody else. Yeah, no worries. I, I, I appreciate the candor. All right, thank, thanks a lot for the question. Thanks. We have a follow-up question from Kurt Woodworth of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Um, one of the questions that I had is, is that my understanding is a lot of these new um, electric arcs that are you know, under construction or, or planning stage um, are going to utilize, and I think you kind of spoke to this, um, you know, the, the larger size, you know, more higher tech product, uh, a lot in the 32-inch diameter. So I was just wondering if you could kind of speak to, you know, your capability in the 32-inch size and you know, if all of the growth is coming in this kind of one particular product or, you know, the very large size diameter, um, you know, how, like, how are you positioned for that? And then can, can you speak to how tight that market is today? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks, Kurt. The, um, uh, as, as we see a lot of these high efficiency furnaces coming on, uh, you're absolutely right that, um, uh, many of them are going with uh, larger and larger uh, graphite electrodes. The 32-inch market is still, you know, in fact, uh, uh, you know, 
reasonably are in fact quite small and uh, uh, mostly focused just on a couple of uh, a couple of applications here in the U.S. As we project out, uh, you know, five, six, or seven years, we'll see the 32-inch become a um, uh, you know more of a standard. Uh, currently, uh, what we're seeing is that you know the 30-inch or 750 millimeter, depending on which side of the ocean you're on, is uh, is is really the uh, uh, the standard for supersized electrodes. You know, because we're seeing a lot of 750s, even 700s are uh, what we're seeing on a lot of the new furnaces. And as we think about those. Uh, those larger electrodes, that's really where a lot of our value proposition comes into play. You know, as we think about the um, 700s and 750s that the market's really demanding of us right now, that's where, you know, we like that space because that's where we have insulation from some of the more cost-oriented competitors and gives us an ability to sell our product on a value proposition basis where those customers value um, you, you know, not just uh, not just our product technology, but our technical service, as well as uh, the surety of supply that we give them in uh, in those sizes. And so, um, you're exactly right that as we're seeing more conversions of mills going from the integrated pro uh, steel making routes to electric arc furnace, the uh, the size of the electrodes is continuing to grow. Um, you know, the 800s or 32-inch that you're talking about is still a relatively small part of that market, but, uh, but will grow as we progress through, uh, you know, through the, the balance of this decade. And, um, uh, you know, we like our position on supersized electrodes. Uh, you know, right now as we think about the uh, 700 and 750 millimeter electrodes, that's really where our uh, where our primary focus is, given that that's the heart of the market, and we'll be ready for uh, uh, you know to spend more time on the 800s or 32 inch as that uh, as that becomes a bigger part of the market. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. There are no other questions from the phone lines. I would like to turn the conference back to Marcel Kessler for closing remarks. Thank you, operator. I would like to thank everyone on this call for your interest in GraphTech, and we look forward to speaking with you next quarter. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude your conference call for this morning. We would like to thank you for participating and ask that you please disconnect your lines.